Monarch Legacy of Monsters is shaking up the MonsterVerse with some juicy details about Monarch, the secretive organization that's been a staple in the Godzilla and Kong sagas. While we've seen plenty of present-day Titan tussles, the origins of Monarch have mostly been left in the shadows. Until now, this series is taking a fresh angle, splitting its focus between two timelines, the 1950s and 2015. Each era offers a unique perspective on Monarch, giving us a double dose of intrigue. But in this video, we will explore the history of Monarch from the 40s to 2024, spanning more than eight decades of monster action. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What's happening? 1943, USS Lawton loses its track. In Kong Skull Island, the USS Lawton had a unique look, kind of a mix-up between a South Dakota-class battleship and an Iowa class. Instead of a hull number, it sported USS Lawton on its left side. The thing was, it showed up with massive claw marks, hinting at a wild encounter. But in Monarch Legacy of Monsters, the USS Lawton got a makeover, now a Fletcher-class destroyer destroyer, and those claw marks were gone. Another interesting bit, the name's only on one side, not both. And for the first time, we see its stern in the show, rocking Lawton across it. William Randa, the lone survivor from its sinking in 1943, went through a lot. Haunted by the Ion Dragon attack, he joined Monarch to chase down these ancient hidden creatures. The curious thing about the stranded and destroyed vessel was that it was almost 5,000 miles away from from its destination. So how did it end up here? 1944. American fighter pilot Hank Marlowe and Japanese pilot Gunpei Ikari get stuck on Skull Island. 1946. Foundation of Monarch. Following the USS Lawton's incident's chaos, President Truman, under the radar, set up the Monarch Unit. It was a low-key research squad focused on digging into massive unidentified terrestrial organisms, or as we like to call them, MUTO. Behind the scenes, though, some of Truman's crew were skeptical about Monarch's wild theories, but nonetheless, they had to keep their work hush-hush. In fact, over the years, the government went to great lengths to keep the whole thing a secret and away from the public knowledge. 1952, Smog of London. In 52, London got covered in a killer smog, the likes of which nobody had seen before. Weather buffs were stumped. It was a mix of freezing temperatures and no wind, thanks to an anticyclone. An anticyclone is a weather phenomenon defined as a large-scale circulation of winds around a central region of high atmospheric pressure, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere as viewed from above, which is opposite to a cyclone. This nasty blanket hung around for five days, taking out thousands. Some brainiacs at Monarch hatched a theory that a massive creature's wing flaps kicked off this anticyclone. Far-fetched, right? Especially since such a move would have cleared the smog, not cause it. Some thinks it's a nod to Mothra's dusting powers. Plus, there's also speculation that it could be Rodan's or Ghidorah's doing. 1953, Monarch loses a specimen. But by 1953, Monarch got their hands full with a bunch of smaller creatures, enough to fill a secret museum. The crowning jewel of this museum was a humongous cell from a creature called Shinomura. This thing was crazy, like all kaiju are. A single cell could morph into a whole new monster. And of course, their prized cell breaks loose, taking their HQ down with it. Shinomura was a radioactive hive mind horror made of lots of smaller beings. One of Monarch's own, Eiji Serizawa, got hooked on tails of a giant lizard that walked like a man, and began chasing Shinomura's stories across islands. He wrongfully thought it was Gojira, which was straight out of old Pacific Island myths. 1946 to 1954. 
Godzilla vs. Shinomura From 46 to 50, Godzilla and Shinomura were duking it out in hidden spots all over the Pacific Rim. Monarch Unit was always playing catch-up, often relying on what the witnesses said to figure out what went down. Dr. Eiji Sarazawa, one of their top guys, had a hunch Godzilla was chilling in the Challenger Deep, the deepest part of the Marianas Trench. The USS Nautilus, the first nuke sub, even did a little snooping around there between 1950 and 1954, but no luck finding the big guy. Seems like they ticked off Godzilla, though, as he started taking swings at American ships, too, while still on Shinomura's tail. In 1954, on Monster Island, Godzilla faced not one, but two Shinomura colonies. He lets loose his atomic breath and wipes out one, but the other bails. Its next stop was Bikini Atoll, where the U.S. was about to set off a massive hydrogen bomb. Monarch couldn't confirm if Godzilla survived the blast, dubbed Castle Bravo, which also stirred up a heap of trouble by contaminating hundreds of Japanese fishing boats. Bikini Atoll's still a no-go zone, but Monarch got a weird fondness for Castle Bravo. They even named their Bermuda base after it. In 54, Monarch and the U.S. military set a trap at Bikini Atoll, hoping to take out both Godzilla and Chinomura with the Castle Bravo bomb. But of course, we know Godzilla is alive and well. 1959, the curious case of Siberia. During the Cold War's peak, a Russian spy plane snapped pics revealing a massive monarch facility chilling in Siberia, complete with their logo on the canopy. Oddly enough, the Soviets were clued into Monarch since 59, but never made a move against them. Whatever Monarch was hunting for in that icy fortress, they came up empty-handed and ditched the place in the 70s. Meanwhile, in 59, Billy Randa, his wife Keiko, and Lee Shaw hit up a ghosted facility in Kazakhstan. What they found was wild, an underground chamber stuffed with Indos warmer eggs. It's like Monarch was always a step ahead in the monster hunt game, finding these crazy things before anyone else knew they existed. 1973, Skull Island. In 73, Monarch, getting antsy about their funds drying up, teamed up with Landsat and a top-notch helicopter crew for a hush-hush trip to Skull Island, a supposedly mythical spot in the South Pacific that's off the maps. Bill Randa and Houston Brooks, a brainy seismologist, sweet-talked Senator A.I. Willis into backing their gig, playing the Cold War card to outdo the Soviets. Their squad was pretty eclectic including biologist Lin San, ex-SAS tracker James Conrad, anti-war photographer Mason Weaver, and a tough U.S. Army escort. But Skull Island wasn't a walk in the park. They ran into Kong, a massive ape who wasn't thrilled with their seismic bomb shenanigans and wiped out their choppers. Stranded, the team made a beeline for the island's north shore, hoping for rescue. En route, they bumped into the Iwi locals and Hank Marlowe, a pilot who'd been stuck there since 44. Marlowe clued them in on the skull crawlers, nasty underground beasts that backed up Brooke's hollow earth theory. Things got messy when Randa became a skull crawler lunch during a scrap at Kong's parents' gravesite. The army leader, Colonel Packard, was bent on taking Kong down as payback, but ended up unleashing a mega skull crawler, the Skull Devil. It all came to a head when Kong showed up and duked it out with the Skull Devil, saving the day and the remaining expedition members. 1991, Rodan's Discovery. In 91, Monarch pulled a sneaky one. They set up a quarantine zone around a sleeping volcano on the island called Isla de Mara, pretending it was all for environmental research. But that was just the start. What kicked off as a few tents and some science gear morphed into a full-blown containment facility right at the volcano's mouth. They were playing the long game, setting up shop for something big under the radar. Of course, they knew that a monster was resting inside the volcano. 
1995, an unsanctioned trip from Birth of Kong. In 95, a seismologist from Skull Island, Houston Brooks' son Aaron, led a rogue trip to Skull Island. Their plane got a warm welcome from a psycho vulture, crashing them into a death-defying chase with death jackals. Luckily, Kong swooped in, saving their sorry skins. The survivors bumped into some friendly Iwi villagers, and a kid named Otto, who'd picked up English, filled them in on Kong's big deal status with his people. Otto offered to take them on a Kong themed tour of the island's sacred spots. It was all good until a siren jaw appeared, only to get knocked out by Kong. The carcass attracted all sorts of nasty creatures, so the team ditched the tour, trying to sneak back to the village through the Valley of the Fallen Gods, where Kong's folks met their end. They were almost skull crawler snacks, but managed to hide out in Kong's old baby cave. After a narrow escape, they called for a pickup, but Walter Aricio, their mythographer, had other ideas. He blasted their ride with an RPG and went full villain, even blowing up the Iwi village's wall, letting in some mother long legs. But Kong, true to his rep, rolled in and squashed the long legs. Riccio, thinking he had proven Kong's godliness, got a divine smush from Kong's fist. Brooks finally got his moment with Kong, realizing his dad was spot on about the big guy's role in the island's balance. Stuck on Skull Island, Brooks decided to hang with the Iwi and sent his story out to sea, an old school message in a bottle style. 1999, Janjira. Back in 99, things got real for Monarch. Universal Western Mining stumbled upon a rad-riddled cave in the Philippines. When their gear made the valley floor give way, Monarch sent Dr. Vivian Graham and Ishiro Sarazawa to snoop around. Inside, they hit the jackpot, the bones of Godzilla relatives, and two mutospores. One of these buggers was already on the move, thanks to some fresh air exposure. This male muto beelined it to the Janjira nuclear power plant in Japan. It knocked out the power and started munching on the reactors, cocooning itself. Sandra Brody and her crew managed to stop a radiation leak, but it cost them big time. Trying to off the Muto wasn't in the cards. Too risky with all that radiation. So Janjira got evacuated and slapped with a quarantine tag, while Monarch built a containment zone around Muto's new crib. Meanwhile, the U.S. hauled the other spore, still snoozing, to a high radiation spot in Nevada. 2005, The Mercenary. In 2005, Alan Jonah, an ex-British Army colonel turned MI6 agent, found himself in a tight spot, a Pakistani jail cell. Alan and his crew of mercs got nabbed while trying to crash a secret Muto dig site. Monarch agents were on them like flies on honey, shutting down their not-so-covert operation real quick. Jonah's reputation as a mysterious mercenary? Well, let's just say it took quite the hit that day. 2009. In 2009, while Monarch was all eyes on the Janjira cocoon situation, another team, led by doctors Eileen Chen and Emma Russell, hit pay dirt in China's Yunnan province. They found themselves in the Temple of the Moth, face to face with Mothra. Turns out, Mothra is not just one creature, but a whole legacy, worshipped for ages and seemingly chiller than most monsters, even rumored to have been Godzilla's ally back in the day, but the Muto got the jump on them, hatching first. Meanwhile, Sandra's hubby, Joe, a nuclear physicist with a knack for echolocation, had sniffed out the male Muto's signal pre-attack and got hooked on uncovering what really went down. 2012. Just as he was about to hang up his hat in 2012, Monarch old-timer Houston Brooks got a cryptic parting gift, an encrypted recorder from his son. As I already mentioned, his son's rogue Skull Island expedition went south big time. He was the sole survivor, but the news wasn't all grim. The kid had scooped some mind-blowing intel about Kong. Juicy details on his backstory, his life on the island, and how the place has changed since Houston's own day of adventure there. It was a retirement shocker that Houston never saw coming. 
2014, G-Day. When a lady Muto popped up in Nevada, the US military cooked up a plan, which was to kill them with nukes, which is kind of like trying to kill a lion by serving it a goat. They wanted to bait both Mutos and Godzilla to an island near San Francisco using a nuke. The big idea? Blow them all up. But Dr. Ishiro Serizawa wasn't buying it. He figured Godzilla could handle the Mutos without the nuke and that the blast wouldn't do the trick. Despite Serizawa's beat, with the plan, the military went ahead, flying the warhead over San Francisco Bay. But the male Muto messed up everything with its EMP, swiping the armed nuke and carting it off to Chinatown for a rendezvous with its mate. They got all cozy and started building a nest. This was when Big G entered the scene, making a grand entrance in San Francisco Bay, looking to crash the Muto baby-making party. The military opened fire, but Godzilla shrugged it off, even as he accidentally trashed the Golden Gate Bridge. Meanwhile, a military squad was on a mission to grab the warhead from the Muto's love nest. Godzilla was busy duking it out with the female Muto when the male Muto dashed off to help, leaving the nest unguarded. The soldiers snagged the warhead, but couldn't defuse it. Plan B? Get it to the docks and ship it out to sea before it goes boom. Back at the nest, Ford Brody, one of the soldiers, went rogue, blowing up the Muto egg with a gas pipeline. The Mutos, ticked off, stopped fighting Godzilla to check their nest. When the female Muto caught Brody in the act, she was about to make him pay, until Godzilla stepped in with a killer atomic breath. The male Muto went one last round with Godzilla, who ended it by slamming it into a building. At the docks, the female Muto was on a rampage, but Brody managed to get the warhead on a boat. Just as the Muto's EMP stalled the boat, Godzilla showed up for a dramatic finish, taking down the female Muto with a direct hit of atomic breath. In the aftermath, Godzilla, totally spent, collapses. Brody gets airlifted out as the warhead detonates safely at sea. Next morning, with emergency crews buzzing around and Godzilla stirring back to consciousness, everyone's left wondering if this massive creature is actually the city's unlikely savior. Then, like a boss, Godzilla heads back to the sea. 2015, a year after G-Day. In 2015, a year post G-Day, we dive into the lives of Kate, Kentaro, and Mei as they get wrapped up in Monarch's world in Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Since Godzilla and the Mutos rock the scene, people are still adjusting to this new, wild reality of Titans. Signs like the Godzilla warning at airports and Titan alarms causing chaos in Tokyo show that everyone's still on edge. The trauma of G-Day is especially real for Kate, who's dealing with some heavy personal stuff from that day. The series bridges a crucial gap in the MonsterVerse. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, set in 2019, jumps five years after Godzilla's first Muto showdown. Monarch Legacy of Monsters fits snugly between the earlier MonsterVerse events, digging into the immediate fallout of Godzilla's grand entrance. At this point in the series, the general public is mostly in the dark about Monarch and the broader Titan scene. They're mainly aware of Godzilla and the Mutos, but the revelation of 17 Titans in King of the Monsters and Ghidorah's Global Titan Rally are still in the future. So, while Monarch might have some Titans on the radar, the full extent of these colossal creatures remains a mystery to most folks. 2016, Ghidorah's Discovery. Monarch stumbles upon this epic superspecies trapped under the Antarctic ice. Dr. Vivian Graham, always on top of her game, spearheads the mission to set up a top-secret facility right over this sleeping giant. 2019, Monarch gets increasingly militarized. By 2019, during the whole King of the Monsters saga, Monarch wasn't just a bunch of scientists anymore. They'd beefed up big time, sporting their own military-style setup with various branches. Their Air Force was decked out with all sorts of gear. Bell Boeing V-22 Ospreys, Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II jets, and the star of the show, their Flying HQ, the USSR 
cargo. They even had pilot Aubrey Burns leading a fleet of cutting-edge jets made just for Titan brawls. On the ground, they rolled out G-Team, a special forces unit tailored for Titan throwdowns. These weren't your average grunts. Many were hand-picked from the U.S. military, the cream of the crop for dealing with giant creature chaos. 19. 2024 – Monarch X Apex In 2024, Monarch and Apex Cybernetics teamed up for a mission straight out of a sci-fi flick. They ventured into the Hollow Earth, aiming to steal an energy source for a mega-weapon. Why? Well, Godzilla had seemingly gone rogue, turning on humanity and they needed something big to take him on. However, Monarch, thinking they were just reining in one big lizard, had no clue about Apex's true endgame. Marvelous Videos is going all guns blazing into the MonsterVerse, exploring everything there is to explore from the past to the present and the future. You'll find Deep Dive and other videos on the latest MonsterVerse TV series, the upcoming movie, and much more. So if you're a Gajira or Kong fan, I suggest you stay stick around with us. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.